And welcome to the verdict. Uh, Ken Myers uh, with uh, Mick Cornett again uh, this morning, uh, talking to you uh, on Sunday morning here in Oklahoma City and Tulsa and around parts of the state. Really glad to have you. Mick, good to see you. Good morning, Ken. Good to see you as well. We got an exciting show for the first one today. Yeah, uh, you took the lead in assigning these guests. Nice job today, especially this uh, this show coming up. Well, you can't imagine how much it cost us to, bri to bribe Burns Hargis to come on and do a show with us, but, but he was willing to do it. Uh, Burns, of course, is president of Oklahoma State University, just doing a fantastic job up there. Absolutely. And, you know, he, he provides a steady hand, but there's nothing normal about the 2020, 2021 uh, college schedule. This, this yeah. is all. We're going to get into that and how things are going in Stillwater with the COVID-19 and uh, all the other things that are going on up there. Uh, when we come back, uh, folks, you're watching The Verdict. We'll see you in a couple of minutes. I was very lucky to have Holmes Tuttle as my father. In 1965, my father and two other prominent businessmen in Los Angeles went to Ronald Reagan and encouraged him to run for governor. As time went on, they garnered a, a number of other prominent people to support Reagan, and that's what became known as the Kitchen Cabinet. I'm Bob Tuttle. I'm the former United States Ambassador to the United Kingdom, and I'm very proud to be a Chickasaw on the day that President Reagan was inaugurated. And there were my parents uh, seated very close to the president in the presidential box. And I thought, you know, maybe we wouldn't be here without my father. That was a very, very proud moment. I can remember him saying to the president, Ron, this is what I think is best for the country. Every time I come to the library, I walk down the colonnade so I can take a look at that beautiful plaque. I think of my, my parents to see them there and know how important they were to the Reagans and how important the Reagans were to them. And all he wanted to do was to do what was best for his country. When my father had passed away, President Reagan spoke at his service, was, was very moving. And I think part of his growing up in Oklahoma um, made him love his country, love his nation, and uh, the pride of being a Chickasaw. See more stories about the Chickasaw people at profilesofanation.com. One of the best kept secrets about the Post 9-11 GI Bill benefit is that it can be used at a trade school or a technical school, and it doesn't have to be used at a university or college. These are benefits that the veterans have earned through their service, and they should take advantage of it. Veterans really need to understand that there are many resources offered by the Oklahoma Department of Veteran Affairs. They are there to help you find the right school for you, the school that will help you and your family make great steps into your future. And welcome back to The Verdict, Kent Myers uh, with Mick Cornett this morning, and we are really pleased to uh, bring to you uh, Burns Hargis, the president of Oklahoma State University. He has been the president for the past 12 years, just doing a fantastic job up there. And before I introduce Burns, I want to tell you the title of the show. It's uh, Leadership Matters. Uh, probably no better uh, phrase or more apt phrase uh, for then for right now in the middle of all we're going through that organizations such as major state universities need to have strong, effective and kind and friendly leadership. And certainly Oklahoma State is um, uh, fortunate to have that circumstance now with Burns. Burns uh, <clears throat> uh, has been, as I said, president of Oklahoma State University for 12 years. He did his undergraduate work at, uh, at Oklahoma State University. He's only the second uh, president at Oklahoma State University that also did their undergraduate work there. Uh, Oliver Wilhelm was the first. Uh, after uh, doing his undergraduate work and getting a degree in accounting, he went to OU Law School where he graduated and uh, then started an outstanding career, a multifaceted career as it turned out, uh, practicing law, 
being involved in banking, uh, where he was vice chairman of the board of um, um, Bank of Oklahoma. Uh, he uh, then, uh, well, of course, at the same time, was doing uh, a, a competing television show for us. Uh, his show was uh, called Flashpoint, and they started uh, before we did, and they're still going. I don't know how they're still going without Burns, but they still are. Uh, he then, um, of course, at the same time, was uh, engaged in many philanthropic and charitable uh, endeavors, trying to make things better around the state of Oklahoma. And, and uh, then he uh, was uh, in 2000. Uh, uh, well, he's been there 12 years, yeah, so it was uh, 2008 he was named president of Oklahoma State University and started serving thereafter. Burns, uh, after all of that, uh, all I can say is welcome. We're sure glad to have you. Thank you, I and mean, congratulations on staying on the air this long. <laughs> well, nobody's more surprised than the two of us. <laughs> Absolutely. Uh, burns a lot of constituencies when you're a university president. You've got the students, you've got the students' parents, you've got the faculty, you've got the additional staff, and in some ways you've got the alumni. Um, how have all of those constituencies helped you or hurt you as you got ready for this season? Well, well you left one out, and that's employers. That's <laughs> also a major constituency. Uh, but, uh, no, we've all come together, and that, that's, that's kind of a, a – I think somewhat uh, becoming trait of uh, OSU uh, folks is they, they do tend to come together and we had to come together in, in victories and in some terrible tragedies over even the time that uh, Ann and I have been here. But uh, uh, we've, have, we've been a very collegial, uh, had a very collegial approach to this, uh, this remarkable time. We were having, I, I, in my report to uh, the regents, I said, uh, uh, for the 19 uh, fall of 19 and spring of 20, I said it was it was a very good year, like almost, because up until really late February or early March, uh, we were just doing great in every every uh, area that I could think of. Well, we could have won a few more basketball games and football games, but uh, we really uh, were doing just great. And the enrollment was looking great for the this fall. And uh, then, boom, everything happened. And Joe Harris at OU and I got together and thought that it made sense to come back after spring break virtually uh, because, uh, you know, our students were going to the four winds and no telling what they'd come back with. And uh, so we uh, – and it really was a Herculean effort to go convert to a virtual uh, – offering uh, in just that short amount of time but uh, but we we were able to do it OU was able to do it and a number of other schools around the state and uh, and so uh, really that what week past spring break was what we call dead week and then finals week was the following week uh, so it worked out really well and in fact we're going to follow that same path this uh, this fall we're going to uh, go virtually after Thanksgiving so we'll try to get as much in as we can uh, before Thanksgiving, and then uh, hopefully for those couple of weeks after Thanksgiving, uh, follow the same pattern. So, uh, no, I, I've gotten a lot of support from uh, from all quarters, and and uh, we couldn't have done it without it. Burns, uh, I know from personal experience just how difficult it is to go from uh, as a as a, a teacher to go from face-to-face uh, -face learning to virtual learning and to convert internally through Zoom and all the other technical things you have to deal with. Fortunately, our average age of faculty is uh, low enough that they, they were, computers were around when they, when they were growing up. <laughs> well, um, but it, it really has gone, it, it's it gone very well and uh, we've, we, converted every classroom to a video format as well. So, wow. it, for example, if you're quarantined, uh, then you can still access your class. Uh, they call it synchronous if you actually tune in yeah. when the class is happening. Uh, and Or you have just general uh, the conventional online where you just access it when, you, uh, when you're able. Uh, so every classroom is socially distanced. In fact, we've We've converted a lot of 
unusual venues to classrooms. For example, Boone Pickens Stadium, uh, Gallagher Ive Arena, the Alumni Association, uh, West Watkins Center, uh, the Student Union Ballroom. I mean, there, any ven venue we can find where pe we can socially distance people, uh, we're doing that. Where that's more difficult, we might have a hybrid where you, it's a Tuesday, Thursday class, you go on Tuesday and do it virtually Thursday and so on. So there's been a lot of adjustments, but uh, all in all, uh, we're into our, this is our third week uh, now, and uh, it's, uh, uh, we've had, as we expected, a good number of positives. Uh, but when we, when that happens, we can't do contact tracing. Uh, we have kind of an unusual or somewhat unique um, uh, uh, process where we, we have about 5,000 uh, Wi-Fi points around our campus, and those can track where the phones are going and how long a phone, two phones are in, in uh, proximity with each other. So we're obviously looking, somebody tests positive, we want to see who that person was around long enough to have possibly infected them and let them know. We don't give away the name of the person that was infected, mm. but we want them to know they need to go get a test and, and, and be careful in quarantine. What, what is the scope of the testing process? How do you, how do you put that together and, and what would, a, what would a, a student uh, expect on a weekly or a monthly basis? So we converted our diagnostic lab uh, to processing these tests and we were for a long time doing by far the most processing in the state. We, we were doing up, upwards to 2,000 a day. Wow. Uh, and well, got to... Uh, Birds, excuse me, we are out of time on this particular segment. we got to jump to a break, but we will come back after the break and talk more with Burns Hargis, the president of Oklahoma State University. You're with Mick Cornett and Kent Myers. You're watching The Verdict. Got to pay the bill. OU Law has a history and heritage that are unparalleled. At the University of Oklahoma College of Law, we empower our students to pursue the career of their dreams. We have the highest U.S. news ranking ever achieved by an Oklahoma law school. We are the first law school in the country to launch a college-wide digital initiative. And this year, our competition teams rank number two in the nation. OU Law, generations of excellence, limitless possibilities. The good life comes naturally to Tulsa, where nature's beauty is matched with an eye for aesthetics. A legacy of neighborhoods graced with lawns and landscaping and handsome homes. A place that seems to have patented an ideal lifestyle. Bank First is loyal to the quality of life Tulsa assures its citizens to the priority placed on education, culture, and growth. Loyal to builders who transform raw land into residential charm. Developers who see opportunity and add vitality to Tulsa's economy. Bank First serves both enterprise and private lives that need a loyal partner. It's how we help nurture this city's very good life. Bank First, loyal to Oklahoma loyal to you. And hey, welcome back to the verdict. Uh, Ken Myers uh, with Mick Cornett and our special guest today, Burns Hargis. Uh, making his uh, fourth appearance on the verdict, I'm pleased to say. Uh, Mick, where would you like to go from here? Let's talk about facilities, uh, athletic facilities, academic facilities. Where are you in your uh, continual efforts to try and uh, uh, improve the campus at Oklahoma State? Well, uh, we've been doing a lot over the these past uh, several years. Uh, I, I did want to get to your question when we went to break. Uh, we tested every student when they came into residence halls, uh, and that was about uh, four to five thousand. Uh, and we do free tests now for employees and for uh, the uh, students. And we're beginning 
uh, right now to uh, start doing 500, there'll be volunteers, 500 random tests to see where we are. Because most of the people we're testing, they have a reason to be tested. They've been around someone or maybe they think they're sick and so on. So anyway, they're getting, and they're getting their results back quickly. And we will announce very shortly a uh, uh, approval of a saliva test where you literally spit in a tube and uh, so you don't have to have people with PPE on and all that to do it. So that's, that's going to be a unique, uh, we're, we're, I think, Oklahoma State, Yale, and Rutgers are the three schools that uh, have, have that now. Uh, back to your question. So we've, we've, we've really, I always say facilities don't transform things, people do, but they really do need the, uh, the platforms to be able to reach their full potential. And so we've done that in a number of areas. Uh, the most recent, of course, and the most, uh, the greatest gala was uh, the opening of the Newman Knight Center for the Performing Arts. And that's a very unique building in, in, uh, and program in the sense that the biggest problem that happens in government, I think any of us can agree, is we have, because of the bond requirements for bond proceeds, you only can spend that on capital. Uh, you can't spend that on programming. So we spend all this money on the building, but we don't have any money to spend on the actual uh, programming that goes on inside that building. Well, with the McKnight Center, Ross McKnight, who's uh, an alum and a very successful business businessman, had the he said I chased him around for money for this building forever, and finally said, "Okay, I have an idea. I'll do twenty-five million dollars, but not for the building. I'll do a matching gift of twenty-five million dollars for programming. You got to raise the other twenty-five million for the programming endowment, and you're going to have to figure out how to build the building. And so the the building that opened on October eleventh of uh, two thousand nineteen opened with a $50 million programming endowment. Right. So that yields two to $3 million a year for the programming. And that's why we could afford to have the New York Philharmonic here uh, for uh, three, four days. They worked with our students. They did three concerts. And uh, that's what we want to do is bring in great artists and then have those artists, not only do our students get to watch and, and enjoy them, but they work with them. Mm -hmm. And uh, and that's that's very unique. So that's the model we've been trying to follow uh, for uh, these buildings that uh, we built. We're we're embarking on a new agriculture uh, center, which uh, is of course a, a big area of expertise for us and a, a huge area for the economy of Oklahoma. Uh, that'll be a we had a, a, a the alum Larry uh, alums Larry and Kayleen Ferguson give us fifty million dollars toward that project. Uh, we built a new business building, which is a w wonderful facility. Uh, of course, Boone Pickens Stadium, uh, and and then more recently the uh, Old Brake Baseball Stadium, which sadly we were unable to uh, we were unable to open uh, when we wanted to because of COVID. And uh, but hopefully it'll be ready to go next spring. Uh, we also had new tennis facilities, and we were hosting the national championship in tennis. Uh, the spring, but that got canceled. So uh, there's, there's just been a number of uh, a number of things that uh, we've built to improve the facilities. We've also worked very hard on the campus uh, because a campus is a, a beautiful campus is a great place to be, but it's also a great recruiting tool. So I think some people come up here come up here from Texas expecting a corral and a barn, and they they think they're in New Hampshire. So it, uh, we've, we've invested a lot in, in that. In fact, when I got here, we didn't even have a sprinkler system on campus. Uh, so we've, uh, we've even fixed that. But uh, it, it's, uh, it's, gone, it's gone very well. And we actually, our enrollment is up for the fall, which is unique. Uh, and, and I can't explain it, but we, we, uh, we actually are up. Our, Retention has gone way up. We have the all-time high retention for freshman to sophomore at 85%. Um, so uh, we're holding our breath and, and just we want to try to keep everybody as safe with, as possible again. Wear those masks, wash your hands, keep your distance, and uh, I think we can get the semester in. Now, Birds. First of all, oh, let's go ahead. Go ahead. 
Well, we're, we are, you know, the Big 12 uh, presidents decided we would go forward, that we had medical advice. Uh, we have a team uh, from, uh, well, they're from several places, but the lead is from Duke, who is also advising the NFL. And uh, we, uh, we decided, even, even in the wake of the Big 10 and the Pac-12, deciding not to play, uh, we, our medical experts say that if we follow the protocols that we have in place, uh, testing three times a week, uh, once 24 hours before game time, uh, having good quarantine and isolation policies, uh, we can play. And so uh, we'll have our first game is September 12th against the Tulsa Hurricanes, which is convenient because it's only an hour away and, and uh, we, can, uh, we can work on uh, their protocols as well as, well as ours. The we uh, a number of games by two. Yeah. Um, so you're playing two less games, but you're playing the full Big 12 schedule plus one game, I guess. Then. That's right. Each day we decided to do one non-conference game. A lot of that was to try to start a, a little later. You know, we were scheduled to start uh, Labor Day weekend. Uh, and yeah. uh, well, actually the week before that. And uh, so we're, we're starting September 12th, and that's, that's a, we think that's going to be a better start. Uh, Burns, let me ask you this. I know that uh, you wouldn't, in your wildest dreams, probably ever foresee what you were facing when uh, COVID hit, insofar as uh, adjustments that you're going to, ha you have had to make and apparently are making quite well. But that's got to be a strain on some budget somewhere because you wouldn't have budgeted for all of these changes you have to make to make your campus uh, safe to, to occupy. Uh, how are you handling that? Well, we were fortunate to get some of that CARES money uh, back in the beginning. We, we got uh, just under $17 million. Half of that money uh, went to reimburse us for the refunds that we had to do for the two weeks following uh, spring break. Uh, that was about it, as I say, eight million dollars, and then the other other had to be used and should be used for the benefit of students that have been affected by COVID, and so we use that money now. The money for testing and the uh, sanitation of the campus, uh, the the daily cleaning, uh, a lot of the converting each classroom to a video platform as well as an in-person uh, classroom. Yeah. Uh, all of that expense is. Uh, added up way past uh, that 17 million yeah uh, and we're we're hopeful that the congress will uh be able to get come together on on uh, another care stimulus and that would offset a lot of that the governor still has funds uh and and may uh may consider uh helping out on that uh, as well uh so it yeah it's been tough and we kept tuition and fees flat uh this year and uh it uh, it's 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 been a it's been a big strain. Uh, you know, our our athletic department uh, is taking cuts. Uh, you know, those each, each game we play, the Big Twelve plays is worth about three and a half to four million dollars. Mm -hmm. So you cut out two games, and you know you you cut out quite a bit of money. Yeah, and those would have been home games, I take it. Yeah, yeah. They both. Let's talk, talk about the budget. What's been the biggest issue with the budget other than less money coming in and expenses probably haven't gone away? Yeah, the, the, uh, the you know, we've been cut dramatically uh, by the state. Our, our state appropriations have, have gone down. Well, the top year that uh, was 2010, during my tenure, the top year and that, that year we were, uh, the appropriation to OSU was $135 million. Uh, last year, the appropriation was $92 million. Mm -hmm. So when, when, when the three of us were in college, uh, the state probably paid a good, more than half of the cost of our education. Uh, today, it's somewhere around 11%. So, you know, people complain, and, uh, understandably, about tuition and fees going up all the time. Uh, but that's that that's the reality of it. If you if you have the state appropriations going down and down and down, you're going to have to get the money somewhere because you can't 
uh, the other states have not disinvested in higher education like Oklahoma has. We've disinvested percentage wise more than any state in the union. And so professors can go. I mean, they're, they're mobile, especially the good ones and uh, the ones that are uh, very productive in the research labs. Uh, they got a lot of options. And for us, we've got to pay somewhere in the market to retain uh, and attract talent. So it's a, very, it's a very hard not to <laughs> untangle. Excuse me, but we're just out of time. This just tells uh, me how short-sighted I was and just uh, setting you up for one show. So we're going to have to get you back because I've got a hundred other questions I'd like to ask but didn't get a chance to. But I would not end this show without uh, giving uh, our regards to uh, Ann. Hope she's doing fine in all this and uh, give her our regards. Uh, got folks, a we've been talking... Program. We've been talking with Burns Hargis, the president of Oklahoma State University. Uh, Mick and I will be right back. It used to be okay in hospitals. It used to be okay in movie theaters. It was okay in classrooms, restaurants, and airplanes. But thanks to a greater understanding of the dangers, that's not okay anymore. So now that we know secondhand smoke causes lifelong health problems, why is it still okay to smoke with children in the car? Bottom line, it's not okay. Let's get serious about protecting kids. Join the fight at StopsWithMe.com. All children deserve a life of hope and love, but sometimes they experience a life of pain, neglect, and abuse. When that happens, each child deserves all the quality, assistance, and representation that can be offered in our legal system. For more information, call 23CHILD. Oklahoma Lawyers for Children, helping to bring hope and love back to the lives of abused children. Welcome back to the verdict, closing this show that we had uh, with Burns Hargis. Very interesting. Always good to see Burns. Don't get to see him as much as I used to. Uh, Mick, uh, what do you think? Well, we, I've got a couple of websites I want to pass along to our viewers. GoOKState.edu will allow you to get more information on the work that Burns Hargis and uh, the rest of the staff at OSU are doing. And we've got a website, as people know, TheVerdict.tv. TV.